Father Lord, we thank you for worship you ancient of days. We honor you for your name that is highly lifted up. In your kingdom, the Bible says there are no accidents. None can deliver out of your hands when you walk, none can hinder it. Your ways are past finding out. Lord, we have gathered once again in your presence to hear from your word and to listen to what you have to teach us. As the prophet said, I will sit, stand upon my watch tower in the book of Ezekiel and I will watch and I will hear what he will say to me. Lord, tonight we have come to stand upon our watch tower to watch and to hear what you will say to us. We know your word will minister grace to our hearts. Holy Spirit, open our understanding. Grant us wisdom to learn what the Holy Spirit has to teach us today. Grant us divine grace to minister the word of God without fear or compromise. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, we welcome once again <clears throat> to this open house fellowship. <clears throat> this is an opportunity for the word of God to be preached. Open House Fellowship is a non-denominational Christian service. Our links are below, and you can also download our study app to study our mission programs and our College of Theology. God bless you as you participate. Today, in our course on understanding Badlika prophecy, we are taking the topic that says, Writing Your Vision. Why is it necessary for a believer to write his vision and to make it play? To put it on top of tablets so that it might run for many days. Today we are going to be taking the topic, writing your vision. It is necessary as we journey through life to write down our vision, to make it play. To put it on top of a stone or tablet so that it might run many days. When is it necessary for believers to write down their vision? Christians should learn to write their vision when it comes to trade, vision when it comes to study, marketing, even ministerial calling. It is compulsory for believers when you have a dream or vision. Something you do not understand, or you cannot really penetrate it. You should write it in a tablet and make sure you kept it safe so that it can run for many days. It is necessary in the ministry for such vision to be kept safe, either in archives or in your prayer altar, in case there is any element of the vision where you are not clear, so you can easily seek the face of God and understand what He has to say concerning that particular vision. And I tell you, at the end of the vision, it will always speak and it will not lie, just like the Bible said. Christian's writing vision has been from the ancient times. Today, we will use this opportunity to reflect on the Bible, to know where visions have been written in the past, and how it has affected the life of believers who wrote such vision. Today, we shall be taking a clear look at the book of Daniel and Habakkuk, who take their time to write the vision of God, and to make it plain, and to sit it on top of a tablet that will not rot away so that it can be shared for many years to come. So believers today are encouraged in the same vein to put their vision in writing. You might say which generation is coming after us. After all, we are the last generation. Who am I writing the vision for? You don't know how many days of life you have or the times of events that will come tomorrow. People at a point in their life will go through the written vision 
and they will cross check the history books and say so long so pastor or ministers or a, a member of social and social church writes this vision on social and social date now this vision has come to pass even as it was written but on the other contrary way you write the vision you do not understand so that you can table it to God in prayer and God will give in tongues the interpretation as we found in the case of Daniel. Writing visions are of two principal characteristics. One, we write vision so that other people can learn from it. Secondly, we write vision so that we can in terms present it in prayer before God and see what God will say concerning such vision and how it applies to either our life or the people around us. Today's teaching is going to be exciting. We're going to be diving into the scriptures to understand biblical prophecy through this particular topic of writing your vision. We're going to be taking a hint from the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. We say, I stand upon my wash tower, and I will set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me. The he here represents God. And the wash tower here represents your altar, your place where you watch and pray in your home, or your secret place. Remember the Bible told us last week where we studied that he that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So it is very important for believers to write vision so that this vision can be taken to the secret place of God. And where is the secret place of God? Your place of prayer, your place of devotion, your place of meditation, where you sit one on one with God and meditate upon what God has said concerning a particular topic, concerning the voice of God that refer you to a particular verse in the Bible. I will give you an instance. Yesterday night after praying, we meditated on the voice of the Lord. And the Lord said to me, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And I took it to my secret altar, and I kneeled down before God and asked him to explain what this vision is about. So why am I using this as a reference to you? For you to be able to understand that when you sit upon a watch tower or when you write your vision, you can literally do the same thing, take it before the altar of God to have clear understanding of what that dream which you forgot in the night, which you have no clear understanding of the positive or the negative meaning to your life. God can explain it to you. For example, let's go to Genesis. In the book of Genesis, Joseph has a dream. Joseph has a dream. And because he was not conversant with writing it down, he told his brother. And his brother became another reference point to those dreams. Whether you may call it negative or positive reference point, there was a reference point. So that when the dream came to pass, <clears throat> Even his father could testify to the fact that that dream indeed was from God. <clears throat> and that that vision of Joseph did come to pass. Joseph had a dream and he told his brother. And his brother understood the meaning of the dream instantly. That the dream means that they will bow down and worship their younger brother. Which was not something that was very privileged. For them to be happy about. Because nobody will be happy to see that somebody junior to you, whether in office or in the church or at home or in your marriage, will not be your leader or your head for you to bow down and worship such a person. Except there is a kind of humility found in you that was in Christ, who, though he was a God, humble himself, guide about himself, 
a rack of towel and begin to wash the disciples' feet. And so God expects that kind of humility from us. But I tell you of the truth, not every man has such humility. And this characteristic was trivial for the reason of today's story. Why we need to write the vision. This prophet in the book of Habakkuk 1 verse 3 was talking about him sitting on a watchtower and watching to see what God will say to him. What and what he will be able to answer when he is reproved of God. For the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. He was waiting for either correction from God. A lot of us, we want to receive praise from God, not correction. We want to receive blessing from God, not reproof. But this prophet was waiting for either what God is going to say in promotion or in reproof of him. And this is one of the classic examples of what churches today have devolved into. People are running from toe and fro, not because there are no messages in the church where they live or where they fellowship, but because the messages in some church is not the message they want. Therefore, they conjure up prophets for themselves and search for teachers who will tell them what they want to hear and to give them the message that are pleasant to their ear. Everybody does not need to pass in the school, some children fail. That is how it's, it is. Everybody in the world cannot be equal. That is not how God created the world. Some will rise above the other. Even the Bible tells you to him that has one, even the one he has will take it away and give it to the one that has it. So God expects you to compete, to struggle, to achieve a goal by labor, by hard work, by promotion. God does not expect you to fold your hands and to feel that I am created as a dysfunction. If you accept that claim that you were created with disability, that means you have made God a liar. Because the Bible says, Behold, God saw that everything he made was good and was very good. By the time you now accept your inability to be like others, that means you have made God a liar. When you begin to sit and cry over the decision of your enemy, rather than to stand in faith and contend, God look at you as he look at the children of Israel in weakness. Because you have made God too weak for the enemy. When the children of Israel got to the boundary of the promised land, Moses decided to send 12 stars to the land of Canaan to spy out the land, to see the area where they are weak and the area where they are strong. He did not send them to assess the muzzle and the thickness of the parts of their enemy. That was not the purpose. The purpose was to see this land was it exactly how God told them it looked like? But they came back with a terrible news. Saying, so indeed, the land is blessed, like Moses said. We saw that everything God said about this land is perfect. But I said there is one thing. As the land is perfect, so is the enemy perfect. So are their strength perfect. In fact, we are like grasshopper. Grasshopper before the enemy. Just imagine. You have not even engaged in a battle. You have not stand in the battlefield with your enemy. You already disdain yourself before them. You make yourself of no significance before your enemy. Oh, the reason why I am poor because I am black. No, you are not poor because you are black. You are poor because you are lazy. Oh, the reason why I am suffering is because my family, my mother left my, my, my father when I was a child. No, that is not the reason why you are suffering. You are suffering because you did not struggle like your mate. God expects you to turn your in, injustice 
or imperfection into perfection. What did Jetta do? Is your case worse than the case of Jetta in the Bible? Jetta's name was called Jetta because his mother gave birth to him in pain. Jabez is a name. Jabez's name was called Jabez. Do you know what it means, Soro? Is your name Soro? Is your pain so much that your name is not called Soro? No. That is why written of vision is significant. The Bible was not just written as a textbook. It was written by experience of events of people who through the ages studied, understood, see with their eyewitness accounts the events that take place in their time. How weak men became strong in battle, like in the case of Jetta. How people who were who thought they were children defeated mighty army and warriors like Goliath, such as in the case of David. They was given prophetic power over the entire kingdom. Women who thought that they were barren had children. These things we are written for our learning. No wonder the Bible says that this whole scripture was given to us for inspiration, for understanding, so that the man of God may be equipped to do every good work. We have a great crowd of weakness that were written for us. For you to understand that it is possible. And if you at the end, after all these weaknesses, still think it is impossible for you to be like your mate, you have something to examine in your head. The Lord clarifically said, Oh, these people, they were too big for us. They were so mighty. How can we go? We just look like grass hopper before them. The children of Anak were also there. Did this not say, children of Anak, that Caleb said, give me this Martin? Give me. 80 years old Mark will say, give me this Martin of giants. You are little beauties. Comparing yourself to grass hopper before them. But 80 years old Caleb took that land and he made it a place of inheritance to prove that one with God is majority. That with God, nothing on earth shall be impossible. But today we still see people who feel that their life are messed up because of their physical structure or because of their beauty. Or because of their opportunity. The Bible says promotion does not come from the east, it does not come from the west, but it comes from the Lord. Is your case worse than that of Daniel? Daniel was deported as a slave. He rose in slavery to become the assistant prime minister in Babylon. Babylon was taken over by an enemy nation, and he rose in that enemy nation to become the most preferred president in the entire land. He was his his enemy plotted and thrown him into the lion den to see his defeat. He rose from the lion den and become a king among them. Who do you think your God is? Do you think your promotions is in your ability, or how much education you have, or how much knowledge you have gained, or how much wealth your father or mother or parent left behind? What about Solomon? Are you as, is your father as rich as Solomon? Solomon was the richest man known to man. Today, estimating his wealth is more than seventy billion dollars. He's far more richer than the richest man on earth. But do you know Solomon, with all his wealth, with all his glory? Said vanity upon vanity because you don't know which son will come after you, you don't know whether it's going to be a wise man or a fool. Because this man may be a fool, he is going to rule over everything you left behind. And what come after Solomon? A fool. He lost all the 12 tribes. The father struggled to keep together, he lost 10 in the first year. All your labor. You know who will come after you. 
Do you know the son you will give birth to? Do you know whether he's going to be a wise man or a fool? Whether he's wise or fool, he's going to rule over everything you have. Brethren, food is for the stomach. Stomach is for food, but God will destroy both. Christians who see themselves as grasshopper are Christians who does not write their vision. There is a reason why God said, count your blessing. Count it. Don't only count your soul. There are so many Christians, when they go to mission field, when they return, the only thing they can count is how many demons they encounter. Not how many people God raised from the dead. Not how many sick God healed. Not how many demons that were cast out. Why are you counting only the negative things in your life? Oh, everybody in my country are poor because I'm black. Because they are all black. Is that true? Is there no president in your country? Is there no king in your country? Is there no governor in your country? Is there no accountant in your country? Why can't you count those ones? Why can't you speak of the good things God has done in that country? Daniel was in Pasha. At about the third hour of the day, he bowed his feet and opened his window towards Jerusalem. The Bible says when Daniel was praying, it was a bad time for the evening oblation. Was there evening oblation? No. Jerusalem is 200 kilometers to the west. East in Rome. The enemy has wasted it. But not in Daniel's eyes. He knew the time. He was deported as a teenager. He's supposed to have forgotten the temple by now. But not in his mind. That's why the Bible says that what has I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against them. Today, a lot of Christians, when I started with this message, my thought was writing the vision. How is this hardly a gospel message? Why would God want me to teach right the vision? Because everything in our life is based on writing it down. If you don't remember what you have achieved throughout your life, you will not know what God has done for you. That's why Jesus looked when they saw a woman wash his feet with his tears in the scripture. It's a strange place in the Bible. Washing feet with tears and wiping the feet with her hair and pour an ultimate of perfume upon his feet. And they say, what a woman. If this man has no, which kind of woman is this that touches him? Ha, I don't think this man is a prophet. If not, he's supposed to know the kind of woman that this woman is. And you know what Jesus said? <laughs> if Somebody you own or that do more. Who do you think will, will love most? Somebody you forgive with you or the one you forgive more? And the guest of the house said, I suppose the one you forgive, you forgive more. He said, that's why this woman love is better than you. When I came to your house for a dinner, you did not give me water to wash my feet. Did you? No. But this woman, she has never ceased to wash my feet with her tears. And to wipe it with her hair. Do you know why? She was forgiven now. Why? She can't have blessing. She wrote it down. She knew what God did for her. The reason why we encourage testimony in churches is not because the pastor wants to take glory. The reason for testimony is for you to count your blessing. So that you can let the people know that's what the Bible says, faith comes by hearing. When people write visions, blessing, the greatness of God in their life, how God took them from zero to something, people, unbelievers will learn from it. The lost will learn from it. And when they learn, they will know that God is good. Even though they speak evil against you, they will, because of your good work, glorify God on the days of visitation. That's why we testify. That's why we talk about the wonderful works of the Lord. Because God is the God of strength. 
Habakkuk said, I sit upon my watch tower. I am not only waiting for blessing, I'm also waiting for rebuke. I am also waiting for what I have done wrong. But if I don't write my vision, if I don't write my dreams, if I don't write my failure, how would my servant learn from them? If I only write the blessing, in Africa today, we have a lot of prophets. And those prophets, they only see good things. And I thank God for that. But I'm not here to condemn anybody. But God also speaks evil. God does not only speak good. God sometimes speaks evil. God does not only see present things. God also sees the dark days. God also has reproof. The Bible says we give without chastisement, we are not sons. We are bastards. Because every father that loves his son must chastise them. I know today we live in utopia. A world where no bad word is encouraged. Where everybody's world must be perfect. Where people are forced to claim they are happy with something they are not happy with. This is not God's plan. Christians should be able to speak their mind. To be able to say no. I remember the song we learned in primary school. He said, wherever you go, wherever you may be, do not say yes when you're supposed to say no. Do not say no when you're supposed to say yes. Christians should learn not to say yes to things they know in their mind is no. To say no to things they know in their heart to be no. Do you know in the book of Romans, chapter 1, from verse 18, the reason why the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteous self of men? Not only because they do evil, but because they take glory in them and encourage those who do evil, even when they know that those things are evil. So, brethren, in considering of today teaching, let not digress. Let us understand. What this prophet was saying. He said, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Write it down. Write the vision. Make it plain on top of a table. Tables of stones. That rain will not wash it away. Not do not write it upon a tea floor or paper. Put it on top of a tablet of stone. Carve it. Make architectural design of the world so that this world can run. That it may run that read it. Somebody that read it will run with the world. The world he was telling the prophet to write was not his. Sometimes God can give you the architectural plan to design a machine, a car, a building, and you are not an architect. Don't say to yourself, this is useless. God knows that I'm not an architect. Or I'm not a mathematician. Why must he give me a mathematic formula? Write it down. Somebody is coming that will read it. And when the person reads it, it will run with it. People that invent the things, they saw it afar off. They wrote it down. Somebody else came to use it for research. It's not the person that discovered the formula for God that later developed it. Somebody else who writes his vision. So, brethren, learn to write your vision. Christians are encouraged to write their vision so that at the end of it, it will speak and not lie. Though it may last for many years, it tarries. I don't, don't think every dream you dream is going to come back to pass the next day. I remember when we were children, when we dream, that somebody is going to beat us the next day, we don't step out of the house. Because we said today, if I go out, they will beat me because I saw it in my dream. But that's not always the case. Some dreams can run for years. Some dreams can run for months. Some for many more years to come. But at the end, it will come. Even though it time, it will not lie. It will always speak the truth. Now, let's go to the book of Daniel chapter 7, from verse 1. What's 
Let's read from verse 1. He says, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of his head, upon his head. And then he wrote the dream. Why would Daniel decide to write the dream? He has a dream. It's just a dream. I wake up, I despise it. No, he wrote it now. And he told the son of the matters of the dreams. And then he spoke and said, I saw in my vision, not only did he write it down, he communicated it. So communicating your dream does not stop you from writing it down. People you told may forget. But books does not lie. Daniel wrote it down. Daniel said, I had a dream. I had a dream and vision of the head upon his bed. And then he wrote it down. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision the night. Behold, four wings of the heaven scroll upon the great sea. Four wings of the heaven scroll upon what? The great sea. And the four great beasts came up from near the sea. And in case you are a student of prophecy who is just joining us, throughout the book of Revelation, we explain this idiom that whenever the Bible uses the word sea, it symbolizes unrest of nation, people. Unrest of nation. And so when Daniel was talking about the four wings of heaven, He's talking about the powers of the four corners of the universe, of heaven. Strove with the sea. What people, tribes, nations, and what came out for beasts. For this beast is used to symbolize something here. They are not animals. They symbolize the terrifying natures of these rulers. Kingdoms. That is what the beast was used to identify. The terrifying natures of these kingdoms. So the four beasts that came out represent four kingdoms. And from one, and they are different from one another, each of these kingdoms. And because each of these kingdoms were different one from another. And the Bible said, Daniel saw that one was different from another, and the first was like what? A lion. Like a lion. He didn't tell you he was a lion, but his strength was like that of a lion. What does the lion represent? A conquering overall. He devoured his enemy. And he bowed down for no one. That is the first one. He looks like a lion. He keeps conquering to conquer. And he has an eagle wings. Eagle, what does it symbolize? The most straightened bears on earth. And the head, till the wings were plucked off. He lost the strength of flight and power and valors. His wings were plucked off and he was lifted off from the earth. Lifted off from the earth. Cut off. Dead. And made to stand on his feet as it was a man. As it was a man. Because man is the only animal that stands erect on two feet. And the man's heart was given to it. Remember in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, the heart of an, a beast was given. But this one, the man's heart was given to this lion heart, conquering heart. 
And behold, another second beast like a bear. And it rises up itself one side, and it has three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, Toss unto it, arise, and devour more fresh. This one was given authority to what? Devour, conquer, butcher, war was in his heart. He may not be as strong as the lion, but he was very prudent in destruction. And after this I beheld, lo, another, like a leopard. Leopard is swift. It can run faster than many animals. And which had upon the back of it four wings as of a foes. Foes. And a beast had also four heads. And that means the kingdom comes in four different parts. That is, four general shall rose up in the place of this kingdom. That is the forehead. So it's from one kingdom, but four rulers spring up. That is forehead. Head of the beast represents the king or the rulers or the emperor or the governor or the president. So these four beasts, this forehead represents four rulers that came from one kingdom. And that means the kingdom was divided into four parts. Has four rulers, so they were so great and vast that it has four rulers and had dominion, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I saw in the night vision, and I beheld the fourth beast. After this kingdom that has four heads, another kingdom series. And this kingdom, this time, and I heard, after this kingdom, and another, beheld a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. This beast could not be explained, but dreadful and terrible was his name. Strong as Sedele. And it has a great teeth as iron, and it devour and break in pieces, and stamp the residues with his feet. And this symbolizes the kingdom of iron. The kingdom of iron, just as much as iron breaking pieces, according to the vision of Daniel chapter 2. And he's saying that iron break in pieces. And the residue is stamps with his feet. So this is exactly how this kingdom looks. The dread and terrible beast was recognized as the kingdom of iron, which was the Roman Empire. And it was dreadful and terrible. And that was the fourth kingdom. And it was exceedingly great. We already know what the first kingdom that was of lion was. That was in Babylon, where Daniel was still there. Remember, he was the head of gold. His strength was like that of a lion. Nobody could stand before Babylon. Even when the Assyrian make his search, they were feasting. So that is how strong they think they were. And after that came the kingdom that was a bit inferior, but also strong, which was the Medias and the Persian Empire. Then after the Medias and the Persian Empire came the Grecian Empire under the Emperor of Alexander the Great, who were known as the Leopard. They were swift in conquerors, conquering the whole world. The last beast here, we're told, was the Roman Empire, which was the kingdom of iron, and it was dreadful and terrible. 
nobody could overcome them in battle. And they never was conquered by another kingdom. But they break apart. Inside rise rebellion within it and it fall apart. And that was the fourth kingdom. And why are we spending time to explain this kingdom? The reason why Daniel thought this vision was important enough to write down. So if somebody thinks something is important enough for, to write down for a successive generation to review, that means we should think it wise enough to review such a vision because we may have one or two things to learn from it. If Daniel could write it down, we could read it. And behold, this beast, like you see, was different from all other beasts. Daniel could not give a name or life to this particular beast, except to tell you that the beast was dreadful and what? Terrible. It was a dreadful and terrible beast, strong and steadily. It has great iron teeth, symbolizing the kingdom of iron. It devour and break in pieces and stamp the rest of you with its feet. Of it. And it was diverse from any other beast that he had ever seen. And before whom there were three of the first horn plucked up by the roots. And behold, hmm. and behold, I consider, wait, let's read it clearly. He said, I consider the home. Behold, there was, there came up and none, came among them another little home. The little home here symbolizes who the Antichrist. He has a great strength, but later on his strength grew. He had he came up to power with just a little strength. He was called the little horn. Before whom, what happened? Tilly kingdom, three kings fell before him. That little horn pulled away three kings to take their place, and was plucked up by the roots. And behold, because horn, when we talk about horn in the Bible, symbolizes symbol of authority, power, that is what horn symbolizes. Horn represents authority and power. It may not necessarily be a king, but it can be a president, it can be a governor, it can be a ruler. Symbol of authority and horn, that is what horn symbolizes. And throne were cast down. Because before this home, before this particular home or king or whatever you call it, throne were thrown down. He defeated kingdoms. Throne were thrown down, and the ancient of days did sit. What? How important is this little one that made Daniel write that the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair? Of his head like wool, like pure wool, and his throne were like a fiery finance, and his will as a burning fire, and a fiery steam issued and came forth from before him. Thousands ministers unto him, and tens time ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set. And the book we have opened. This primarily echoed like we are reading the book of Revelation. But it's not the book of Revelation, it is from Daniel. Daniel is foretelling what he saw in his vision. And because he could not grasp everything the vision was talking about, he decided to write it down. And I beheld, therefore, the voice of a great war. Which the horn spark, and I heard even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning fire. 
as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, but they were not slain. Their authority were taken away from them. They were not killed. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And truly that was what happened. But this particular kingdom was slain because he could not bear to let it continue. And I saw in verse 13, I saw in the night vision, behold, like one like the Son of Man came with the cloud of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And in verse 14, there was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nation, language should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So when God is speaking here, he's not speaking in allegorical interpretation. God is simply telling you that this man, son of man that is to come in the cloud, which is Christ Jesus, obviously, and his dominion was given to him, and the glory of his kingdom, that all people, nation, and tongue, he's not talking of in heaven, he's talking of earth here, should serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and we shall not what pass away. And his kingdom, the Bible says he will rule over the king the, over the house of David forever. So he not say he will rule over the kingdom of heaven forever, but over the house of David forever. So his kingdom is right here on earth, and it shall not be destroyed. Remember Daniel saw the same in the image in the book in the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar saw a mat was cut down by the hand of a man. And that mountain smits the image at the foot of iron and breaks it to pieces. And that mountain becomes a mountain that fills the entire world. And this is exactly the same vision. But this time, God is explaining it in kind of their terrifying wickedness. That is why you see he used the beast. First, he uses three uh, image of a man to illustrate this. But now he's using this to illustrate the same dream to die. And because this dream happened two times, like we see in the case of Joseph, what does it symbolize? It symbolized that the thing was ordained by God and it must surely come to pass. So when, Daniel, when this vision was explained two consecutive times, that means the thing was ordained by God. And if God must surely see it to come to pass. So that was why God repeats this vision to Daniel. That is why it was important for you to write your vision down. Because some vision can happen twice. That means when the vision happens twice, that means the thing is ordained by God. And it must surely come to pass. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit. Why was Daniel grief in his spirit? We are going to come to that. I was, I, Daniel was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body. And the vision of my head troubled me. Daniel was a wise man. The wisest no man in the Bible. And no one was known to be wiser than Daniel except Lucifer. And I came near unto one of them that stood back and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of these things. The three great beasts which are four are four kings which shall rise out of the earth. We already told you the name of those four kings. And but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom from the hands of who? These kings. How is that possible? Through the reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ. And possess the kingdom forever and ever. Remember what the Bible says about the saints. Because the saints may not realize their authority and power. The Bible says, let the saints rejoice rejoicing in glory. Let them sing the Lord upon their coaches. Let the high praise of the Lord fill their mouth. With two edged sword upon their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen. To bind the kings of the earth in chains. 
and their rulers with fighters of iron. This is what Daniel is referring to here. The saints have power to bind the kings of the earth with chains and to execute upon them the judgment of God. This honor every saint has. But when the saints refuse to recognize the authority, the devil uses them as a rag. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom for everlasting to everlasting. And then I would show you the truth of the four beasts, which was the fourth beast. Because the fourth beast was what Daniel was more important, interested in. At least he knows partly about the ministry of Alexander the Great. But this particular fourth beast, he has not yet come in the time of Daniel. Daniel has no knowledge of the Roman Empire. Daniel saw two successive empires. He saw the Babylonian Empire comes to an end. And he saw the Medias and the Persian Empire before his death. But after the Media Empire came the Leopard Empire, which was Alexander the Great. And after that came this dread and terrible beast, the Roman Empire, which he did not know about. So Daniel was clearly wanting to know, because this was something that was, he was eager to know about. The fourth beast, which was different from every, from all the other, exceedingly dreadful. Whose teeth were as iron and his nails as brass. This was truly the Roman Empire, whose shed was made of brass and their sword was made of iron sword, and which devour and break in pieces and stand the residue with his feet. And of the ten horn which were in his head. This ten horn was one of the most significant events in the biblical history. This ten horn are ten kings, which the Bible specified in the book of Revelation, that they shall reign as king, the same time, spotlight time, with the Antichrist. But how does this depend on this particular kingdom? We know that the Roman Empire rules far in the BC, after the death of Christ in the 80s, and the empire has since faded away. What is the Bible referring to in this particular gap and interval of this vision taking part during the reign of the Antichrist, which has not started to reign at the seventh week? And that was what Daniel was really confused about. And that was what he wanted to understand. That's why we have to take note of this particular ten horn on the head of the beast. And of the order which came up later. Because they were originally ten horn, but someone came up later. It was not part of the ten kings, but somebody beat you. And in his place, he removed three kingdoms. <laughs> and that was what Daniel was really considering. He said, He fought concerning the verses, and which was different from every other kingdom, and simply dreadful. Which teeth were as iron, and his nails as brass, which divorce and break in pieces, and stand the rest of you with his feet, and the ten horn on his head, and the order which came up. Which order came up? The little horn. And before, and that little horn we already explained to you was the Antichrist. And before whom Tilly fell. And even of that horn that had eyes. Strange horn that Daniel had not seen the tide before. There was eyes in the horn. He has eyes. He had the power to see and not see. It was not just a physical entity, but also a spiritual entity. And the marks that speak great him, he has first prophet attached to it. And whose look we are more stoned than his fellow. He was a bit different from all his fellow kings. He's, he doesn't look like any of them. So, and I beheld the same home make war with the sect. Remember what we just read that the sect will possess the kingdom and rule it forever. But this little one had power to make war with the sect. Which will preserve the kingdom and rule it forever and ever. 
and he did prevail against the saints. He was more powerful to be able to prevail against the saints. But now the question is that this is where many people get confused with the writer. What saints is he talking about here? Is it the saints that are taken to heaven? But we understand that in the book of Daniel and Revelation, he blasphemed not only against those that were on earth, he blasphemed against the saints that were in heaven. He blasphemed against the saints that were on earth. He blasphemed against the throne of God, against the Lamb, against the saints in heaven, and he defeated the saints on earth. And which saints are we talking about? We are just saying during the Great Tribulation, yes. These Christians were the product of the woman around 44,000 Jewish evangelists and with the gospel. And this we are taking from the 12 tribe of Israel. Remember the work of the two witness prophecies. They get, it was by the spies which Joshua sent to Jericho. They went to Jericho. What did they do? They get Rahab saved. And who was Rahab? The harlot. And that was exactly what these two witness prophecies did. They came and they get who? Israel saved. And who was Israel to God? The harlot. And when they get Israel saved, through Israel, the 12 tribes were saved 144,000 each. Uh, 12,000 each, which became 144,000. And that 144,000 were armed with the word of God. And they lead millions of souls during the great tribulation to Christ. And that is the great multitude in the book of Revelation, which no man could number, that have palm in their hand, and they sing with a loud voice. Because the saints did not sing with a loud voice. They sent to their prince and king unto our God. But this one, they cried with a loud voice, because these were saints, but they were saved like a refugee during war time. That's why the Bible says, blessed are those that take part in the first resurrection of such. The second death has no power. But because they were saved through the tribulation, they did not take part in the they took part in the first resurrection. The second death, which is the final white throne judgment that happened after the end of the millennium, did not take part in them. So they all rose with Christ during the millennium. They were the tribe that were saved from the earth. So these people were saved. They were sent, but they were not sent like the New Testament sent. They were sent like the Old Testament sent. And because they were sent like the Old Testament sent, they were not kingdom priests unto the Lord. The devil obviously have power to defeat them. That was one of the reasons why here, here, because many Christians are confused. They have power to make war with the saints and prevail. Which saints are we talking about? These are the tribulation saints. And until the ancient of days, remember after this Things were finished. Judgment did sit. The ancient of days. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. The saints did possess the kingdom. After all these things. Who saints are we not talking about that possess the kingdom? Remember when Christ had been coming with ten thousands of the saints, according to prophecies made by the earlier world. In the book of Enoch, in the book of uh, Jude by Enoch, Enoch prophesied that the Lord will return with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all the unrighteous deeds which your godly sinner has ungodly committed. So, this 10,000 saints from the earlier world and the saints which were raptured to heaven who are returning with Christ for the marriage after the marriage feast of the Lamb and the saints that were saved from the tribulation, they will possess the kingdom when the Antichrist is defeated finally. And thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from what? All kingdoms. And shall devour the whole earth. And that was exactly what the early Roman Empire did. And they shall shred it down and break in pieces. And they turn home upon the kingdoms. These are ten kings that shall arise. These ten kings shall arise. Don't look for them right now upon the earth. I see many pastors prophesying, telling you the ten kings are this and this and that. 
you cannot know who they are for now because they have not risen to authority at all. And the Bible says, they shall rise after them. They shall be delivered from, from after them, and he shall be delivered from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Remember, it was ten, originally ten kingdom. But out of that ten kingdom, the Antichrist rules and subdued three kingdom. So instead of ten kingdom, they now become what seven kingdom. So they were no longer ten or three, but seven. So the Antichrist will rule over seven kingdom, and after that, in time, he will rule the whole world. And he shall break great. He shall speak great word against who the Most High God. And he shall wear out the scent of the Most High, and shall change time and law. What? Even laws, he will change time and the laws of the land. And he shall be given into his hand until time, times, and divided in time. When Bible uses the word times, it's talking of a year. Times, two years, half a time, which is three and a half years. So the great tribulation is times in stone. It's still a period of three and a half years, not seven years. There is nothing like seven years tribulation. It's three and a half years. The first half is the Antichrist rising to power, which is three and a half years. But after that, the next three and a half years is when he shall establish his wickedness, which is known as the Great Tribulation. So, but the great, then the judgment shall sit, and he shall be taken away his dominion, and to commune and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominion shall serve and obey him. Head that all, it is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, I con a contention which troubled me, and my content has changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. This word was so heavy for Daniel that he could not say it to anybody. He kept it in his heart, and it wearied him out. So that's why he decided to write the vision. And he must have learned from the book of Habakkuk to write the vision and make it plain. But what are the main message we learn from Daniel 7? Chapter 7 will introduce the ten of the four kingdoms, the four super kingdom. We always know that the first the so-called super kingdom were not controlled by God. Because God was not ever looking for one man to take. That's why he scattered the tower of Babel. He didn't want the kingdom of the earth to become one. He wants People to be scattered upon the earth, to fill the earth and to subdue it. That has been his plan. But man's plan has always been to unite, to bind together as a group, so that they can have power, strength, and vigor. But what always happens when people come together, a tyrant takes the lead and he rule over them. And that is why God is always against when people come together too much in one place. God supports unity. But when different fashion and break into little parts and they come together and unite, that is where the power of God flows. But when everybody are banded together in a room in a single place, the only thing you have is one man who has power and vigor, preside over them and take authority to himself and become their king or parent. So that is what always happens. And the terms of the four kingdom, which is that Israel or the world will come under four successive world empire, each worse than the last, <laughs> until the finally, until finally, God and His hosts will end oppression and introduce eternal kingdom. So these kingdoms. They may be big and powerful, but the only thing they can give is oppression. Mm -hmm. What do the fourth beast represent in Daniel? Lion represents the kings of Babylon, which, as I earlier told you, Nebuchadnezzar, he was the lion king who could throw people into fire. 
and could help people <laughs> and make their hearts a piece of heat and rubbish. So this was his strength. And it, the bear represents the king of Persia, who could throw Daniel into the lion den. So that was his strength. And the leopard represents the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, whose kingdom extends from the Europe down to India. So he was indeed sweet like a leopard, and nobody could defeat him in battle. That's why they call him Alexander the Great. The fourth beast represents the Roman Empire under Julius Caesar, who were eventually murdered. And what is the abomination of dissolution in Daniel, in the book of Daniel? The abomination of dissolution is the phrase in the book of Daniel described pagan sacrifice, which is in the second century BC by King Atticus IV, Epiphany, replaced the twice daily offering in the Jewish temple, and alternatively, the altars on which offerings were made was erected to Zeus, the god of the Christian Empire. So, that is the abomination, because why God called it an abomination, and either throughout the scripture is called an abomination. But the ultimate abomination that made this solid is erecting a pagan idol in the house of God. That is what we call the ultimate abomination that made this solid. It's not only that you commit sin outside the church, you come to the house of God and commit it. You can practice all your nonsense outside the church, but you not come to the church and say, now nah, I want to stay right with God people. I want to do the idol and the crime inside the church. And the church allow it and support it. That is the greatest abomination known to God. That is why the Bible calls it abomination that make this so it. So it is not enough. That was one of the reasons why God was angry with the children of Israel. It's not enough they come missing, they come to the house of God and commit it. What are the kingdom, the four kingdom in Daniel 7? The dispensation phase of this interpretation in Daniel 2 to 7 was that the world history is divided into four parts, which associate with the reign of the subjugating Gentiles kingdom. In Daniel, these four king, kingdoms are the Babylonian, the Medes, Persians, and the Greek. And the Roman Empire was the last of the four. Who is the son of man in Daniel? In Daniel chapter 10, 7 verse 13, probably the fact provide more direct relevant background in his vision. Daniel sees one like the son of man. That is who is apparently human. That is God the Son. But how come that Jesus, who was not yet born in the book of Daniel, exists in Daniel's vision? <laughs> that is because he is the pre-existent one and he always lives. <laughs> so he did not come to the earth first time when Mary gave birth to him. He became a man. That's why his name was called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. God became a man. So he was the pre-existing one who was apparently human and yet his individual was coming with a cloud of heaven. That's the vision of revelation saw by Daniel. And John saw the same vision, nothing different. And he approached the, approached the ancient of days. Who was the ancient of days? God, the Father. He is the ancient of days. And he was led into his what? Presence. The presence of the Lord. When he had access in the book of Revelation to take the stroke for the one that sat upon the throne. Now that we understand what this book of Daniel chapter 7 said to us. You see, we've been able to really digest this place because why? Daniel writes the vision. What of if Daniel has refused to write the vision? We will not, we may have known this interpretation, but we may not be able to interpret it because we have nothing to interpret. 
That is the reason why you as a believer also spend time to write your vision and to make it plain so that after many days it will run, it will not lie. It is very important for believers of every fashion to be able to write down visions and make it so plain in their lives so that they can write it. So that after many days, this vision can continue to run for them. As a believer, it is not time to give up. When you decide, when you desire to give up your Christian belief, your faith, for the sake of nothing, it becomes your ability to understand events that happened before you were born become impossible. So as a believer tonight, now that you have learned this truth, that it is important for believers to write their vision in order to be able to assess God's presence, to grow spiritually, for faith to be built up, for you to do the impossible, will you from now on commit to God that from henceforth, every dream you have, both the one you understand and the one you do not understand, you are going to commit to writing it down. Any Bible study you take from the church, what the one you know and the one you do not know, you're going to commit to writing it down so that you can take it to your secret place of prayer, a place of meditation, and meditate upon those words. Remember the Bible says that this book of the Lord should not depart out of your mouth, that you should find time to meditate upon it, whether it is day or night. Do you know why? In it, you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Are you looking for good success today? Are you looking for prosperity today? Today, the only thing and key to those prosperity and success you have been praying for is to meditate upon this book of the law. Find time to meditate upon it day and night because it means you make your way very prosperous and you will have good success. Better let us pray. Before we pray, my name is Missionary Collins. I am the teacher for today. God bless you for being a part of this teaching. We will see you again on Sunday by 5 p.m. next week. Join us in our open house fellowship as we open the mysteries of biblical prophecy. God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word that has come. We thank you for understanding. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for knowledge. We thank you for powers. We thank you for your vision. We thank you, O oh Lord, for helping us to dissect your word. To understand the prophecy that we are written in the book of Daniel and to explain them according to the divine understanding which your Holy Spirit provided. For no man can do anything until it is given to him. Father Lord, as your people today, we commit to writing the vision and to understand them. You will build in them faith, you will build in them understanding to make their way prosperous. And to have good success. I stand as the oracle of the Lord. And I decree healing for the sick. I decree prosperity for those who have none. And I decree wisdom for those who lack understanding. That in everything that the name of the Lord alone will be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we will pray. Amen. Brethren, this is where we will end today's teaching. If you are just joining us, you can still see this video in our website or as part of our program. And you can check through our guide on mission guides and other entertainments like Facebook on CGF Open Hearts Fellowship and on Twitter and so on. To view this video even on YouTube on our channel. God bless you as you participate. Amen.